last few weeks we've been in a series called The Help. And the series, what it's based on is, is the words of Jesus in John's Gospel. When Jesus was with his followers, he told them that when he leaves, he would leave them a helper. He would leave them the Holy Spirit. And as we've explored over the last three weeks, we've explored who is this Holy Spirit. And we've seen that the Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force, but a personal God who is with us. That God we understand to be three persons in one essence, truly God. This idea of the Trinity is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one God, one essence. And so when Jesus said he would leave them physically, he was actually not saying he would leave them completely. In fact, God is always with us as followers of Jesus, in the person of the Holy Spirit. And as we've explored that, we've asked the question, well, what is it that the Holy Spirit does? And we've seen that the Holy Spirit, part of its work in our life is to draw us to know Jesus. That the work of the Holy Spirit is to help us to understand the death and resurrection of Jesus and the significance it makes. And that in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit is gifting us for a purpose, the common good. The Holy Spirit is gifting us for other people. And that the Holy Spirit is guiding us to know that when we have these gifts, it is for the betterment of other people. And these gifts are in a variety of things, such as speaking gifts or teaching gifts, administrative gifts, hospitality gifts. There's all kinds of things that the Holy Spirit does in us that gifts us with for other people's benefit. And so while we sometimes think, well, I'm very gifted at something, it's not for our own gain, but actually for the work that God has in the world around us. And so as we've been exploring who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does, we're going to end with today what I think is the most important thing the Holy Spirit does. More important than how God has gifted us with these gifts of the Spirit, more important than how we use those gifts is what I believe God is doing in us for the betterment of the world in ways that we don't always understand. I believe this morning we're going to explore what I feel is more important than a lot of the things that we put priorities on. In fact, I believe that this is the sum of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And this is something that the Apostle Paul church teaches the church in Galatia. For those of you who are familiar with your New Testament, you know that Paul, as he was traveling in his missionary journeys, we read through Acts, he set up churches. And as he set up those churches, later on he would write letters to them so that they would understand better what it means to be followers of Jesus. And this particular letter, this church in Galatia, He's writing them to understand that what they think is important really isn't important. And that there's division amongst them because some people have put a priority on legalism, following all the rules to make sure they get it all right. And Paul's point is that that's not the way of Jesus. Not that the rules are bad, not that the law, the Old Testament law, was a bad thing. There was a purpose for it. But the way they're going about it misses the point of what Jesus did for them. And it's not in step with what the Holy Spirit is doing with them right now. And so Paul in this church writes to them and wants them to understand what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. And the difference the Holy Spirit makes in their daily lives. So Paul writes them this letter. And in it he writes this, starting in chapter 5, verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. This is an important statement from Paul. He's saying you, me, you, particularly this church he's writing to, are called to be free. We're not meant to feel oppressed. We're not meant to be slaves to anything. We are called to be free. And this calling is a gift from God. It is because of the death and resurrection of Jesus that you and I can experience real freedom. Paul writes them and he wants them to know this. 
You see, what was happening at the time is that there was this group of people who were so concerned about making sure they did everything right, crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's in the law, that they weren't actually being free. So they would do things like, you know, they wouldn't eat lobster, they wouldn't mix their clothing fabrics, you know, men wouldn't shave the sides of, of their beards. They would have all these rules, women wouldn't have short hair, that they had to follow and think, well, this is what makes us right with God. And they were putting it on other people, and it was causing division amongst them. Because people were feeling oppressed by it. They were feeling like, how can I do all these things they're asking me to do? And Paul's going to explain here, and he's going to explain other places, well, that wasn't the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was to make you realize that you could never do all you needed to do to be right with God. That only God can make you right with himself. And that is through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so he's writing to these people who are causing this friction, causing these factions, this division in this church, who are saying, you've got to follow all the rules. And he's saying, no, you're called to be free. You are meant to be free. And when you try and make it about following all the rules, doing all the right things, never doing wrong, in fact, you're f embracing an oppression that it was never meant to be. And now I'm not saying that the law or rules, that there is no right or wrong. That's not what I'm saying, and neither is that what Paul is saying. But what I am saying, and Paul is saying, is that we are meant to be free. And if all we concern ourselves with is doing all the right things, we will not be free. He's going to continue. You're called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. This word flesh that Paul uses is a really important one. In Greek, it's sarks. And it means two, well, it means a few things, but two mostly understandable things. One is the, the literal flesh. It's your skin. It's, it's your, your muscle. It's what's on top of your bones. And so we use it in a term to, to be a very physical thing. But there's also a metaphorical understanding of flesh. It is an idea that when two become one flesh, so in marriage, they are bonded and united. And so the same word that get used for physical flesh is the word that is a unison of people, a bonding of people. And there's another way that Paul looks at this word, and in particular it means this here, but it also means those other things too, which is important to note. Is flesh is used to talk about our personal, non-godly, sinful desires. When flesh gets used, sarks gets used, Paul is often talking about what we do that is contrary to God's design. This is something that we are bonded to, same idea as that two become one flesh. And it's something that we are physically prone to because we are born into a reality that we don't naturally desire the way of God. We're born into sin. This is what's called the doctrine of original sin that some people talk about. That all of us in our natural state We'll do whatever we want to please ourselves. And that's not the way of God. And so Paul is writing to them. He's saying, you are, you are made to be free. You're called to it. And he says, but don't use that freedom to just do whatever you want so you satisfy those desires you have. You satisfy the flesh. He says, rather serve one another humbly in love. So it's not about doing what you want to get what you desire, but it's about serving other people. He says, you and I, all of us, this church in Galatia, are meant to be free. You are called to it. God has invited you into freedom. But don't use your freedom to do whatever you want, to get whatever you want. Instead, see your freedom as an opportunity to love other people. He says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those of you who are familiar with scripture, you know that this is something that Jesus taught. He actually said there are two laws, two instructions in scripture that sum up everything. To love God with all of your being 
and to love your neighbor as yourself. Paul is writing to people who already have that love God part down. In fact, they love God so much they want to do everything right. And in so doing everything right, they are forgetting to love their neighbor. They're making it about themselves. And Paul says, no, you were called to be free. Don't use your freedom for your own selfish gain, but use it to love each other. Because that's what the law is actually all about. Loving other people. Making other people a priority instead of your own desires all the time. He says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. He's dealing with a conflict in their church at this time where people are fighting over, well, you know, how do we demonstrate our love for God? We got to follow all the rules. You got to not eat lobster. You got to not eat bacon. You got to not shave the size of your beard. You got to not have short hair if you're a woman. You got to not have long hair if you're a man. You know, you got to wear these clothes or that. You've got to do all these things. You got to be circumcised, which was a, a big challenge for a lot of people at that time. You got to do all these things. And Paul says that's not the way of freedom. The law was never meant to make you right with God. It was meant to show you you'll never be right with God unless you recognize who God is and embrace the sacrifice of Jesus. That is what the law does. It shows you you can never be good enough. And that's not what God desires. God loves you. He loves you so much that he made a way for you to be right with him through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And it's not something you can do on your own. So as Paul is writing to them, he wants them to embrace this. He wants them to understand. He says, you, you're missing the most important things. It's to love other people. It's not to do all the right things, but it is to love other people. He says, don't use your freedom just to do what you want for yourself. It's not about your flesh. not about your personal desires and selfishness. It's about loving other people. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you will not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So Paul is saying, listen, we are to walk by the Spirit. Our lives should be guided by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who is present with us and should be guided. And so when we are guided by the Spirit, it's not about gratifying our personal desires. It's not about our flesh getting what we want. God's got something better. The way of the Spirit is better. It's not about getting what you want. It's not about your personal desires. That is contrary to the way of God. The way of the flesh is contrary to the way of God. Now some of us, we, we wrestle with this, right? Because we want to experience good things. We want to have happiness in our lives. And so we try to chase things that will give us that gratification, that feeling of good in us. We're trying to maybe drown out some of the sorrow we experience or some of the frustrations we have. So we are trying the best we can. So we try to do things to get what we want. But Paul is saying that is the flesh. That's not the way of the spirit. To try and do things to gratify yourself. This is where we struggle with addiction. Those of you who who maybe struggle with addiction in different ways. Some of you might be substances like drugs or alcohol. For some of us, it might be unhealthy relationships or pornography. For some of us, it might even be social media likes, TikTok views, things that boost our endorphins and we feel good about ourselves in a moment. So we do things to chase that feeling. And if you've ever been addicted to something, you know that what you were addicted to to start with, to give you that feeling, does not last. So you go and try to do more and more and more to get that gratification, to boost those endorphins, to feel what you want to feel. And Paul is saying this is not the way of the Spirit. Pornography will give you a, a, a quick jolt of whatever you need for a moment, but you're going to keep going further down that road. And that's not the way of the Spirit. 
substances that will give you that feeling of like, oh, I'm high, I'm good, will last for only so long. But you'll keep chasing it and it's not the way of the Spirit. The social media likes will only last for so long and you'll be an influencer for so long. And eventually you'll try and do more and more to get that and get it and you'll be empty if you don't have it. And that's not the way of the Spirit. That's not the freedom, friends, that Jesus has given us. Our freedom is not meant to get what we want so that we can feel that endorphin rush to get that high, to get that momentary happiness. That is not the freedom God has given us. Our freedom is meant for love, real love. And when we choose to walk in a life that embraces the sarks, the flesh, that desire to get what I want right now, we're not embracing the love that God has for us and others. And in fact, those fleeting chasings that we have will not satisfy satisfy the longing of our heart. It is only when we walk in step with the Spirit that we can see the goodness of God around us and experience it through our love of others that we will find that satisfaction we chase. Those addictions we chase, whether substances, social media, relationships, sex of some kind, they're not going to satisfy In the end, they'll leave us hollow and empty. It is only when we stay in step with the Spirit and walk daily our lives with the Spirit that we can find that freedom that we are called to. It is only when we give up that fleshly desire, that sarks, that what do I want right now, that we can truly find the freedom we all hope for. Paul's going to continue, he's going to say, the acts of the flesh are obvious. And as I'm going to go read through this, I'm going to say this, it's not that obvious anymore. Maybe for his audience it was obvious. They knew, like, this is what, you know, the people of God did, this is what the people not of God did. But for us in our culture, it is so intermingled, we don't fully understand it. It is hard to sometimes know what the acts of the flesh are. As a society, we've gone in a direction, and some of it's good, and some of it's not so good, where we've kind of decided, okay, well, this is, you know, the way of God, this is not the way of God. And as we've gone in these directions, we're sometimes missing out on what God really invites us to, because sometimes, as a culture, we've made it more about the flesh, the sarks, my personal desires in a moment, and not about the way of the Spirit what's good for others. And so as we try to understand what it means to stay in step with the Spirit, Paul gives them a list that to them was obvious, but to us, maybe not so much. Paul says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. We look at that list and some of us will go, okay, witchcraft, yeah, totally. Sexual immorality, what do you mean by that? Culturally, as a society, we have made a progression where we've said that sexuality is a freedom. And so we said, well, you can do whatever you want. But Paul says, actually, sometimes when we embrace that freedom, it's actually not the way of real freedom. And so we need to reflect by the work of the Spirit in our lives. The Spirit who inspired Paul to write these words. Well, what does this mean for us now? And some of the things that we think are freedoms for us are actually oppressions, slavery we're putting on ourselves. Because the way of the Spirit isn't about doing whatever you want to satisfy the flesh. It's something better. And when when all we do is is consumed by how do we satisfy the flesh, we miss out on what God has for us. The life in His fullness that Jesus promised. So he says, well, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. So many of us are embracing idols. We do it in social media. We, we give the likes and we, we elevate celebrities. We do it all the time. But not just in those kind of forms. What we invest in can become an idol in our lives. Where we put our money is where we put our priority. 
And so for many of us, sometimes an idol becomes food where we're eating out all the time or we're, we're buying expensive things. Sometimes it becomes our family. Sometimes it becomes all kinds of things. Then we say, well, this is the most important. And it's a place where God should be, but sometimes we put other things there. And then witchcraft, and for Paul, these things of sexual morality, witchcraft, uh, idolatry, impurity, and debauchery, they're rooted in his understanding of the Old Testament law. And so the book of Leviticus gives a good understanding of all these things. And witchcraft is much more than, you know, those, those people that go into, you know, a forest on Halloween and sacrifice a cat or something. It's even things like your horoscope. It's those crystals we buy that give us some kind of psychic energy. These things are contrary to God's design that give us a, you know, personal satisfaction in a moment. But we don't understand that some of those things are completely contrary to the design God has for us. And what we think is freedom is actually oppression. So these are like the big ones. And we think, okay, well, we can identify those. For some of us, it's more easy. Some of it's a lot harder. Like I said, culture has shifted so much. We have to work on re-understanding what God designed us for. But he's going to continue. He says, well, you know, so is hatred or discord or jealousy. Fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. When was the last time you were envious of somebody? Maybe it was your neighbor who had this amazing, perfectly manicured green lawn, and yours is kind of all raggedy looking and lots of brown patches like mine. Maybe it was you saw someone with a nicer car than yours, or someone who was thinner than you, or someone with more money. When was the last time you hated someone or something. Maybe it was even flippant. Maybe you said, oh, I hate that person. When was the last time you got really angry for no reason? Remember that time you stubbed your toe? Or that time that guy cut you off in traffic? Or girl? Some of these things, selfish ambition, we do all the time and we don't realize they are contrary to the way of the Spirit. It's about our self-gratification, sarks, the flesh. And Paul's saying this is an oppression. This isn't freedom. Don't, just because God has set you free through Jesus doesn't mean you should just embrace all these things. It's not real freedom. He says, and I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you might be thinking, okay, well, what does he mean by that? Does it mean I'm not going to heaven? Guess what? Jesus died and rose again for you, for the forgiveness of your sins, for the freedom that you are offered, for the fullness of life he offers. This isn't about eternal security here. Jesus has done what he's done, and if you embrace Jesus as Lord, if you confess your sins and you embrace Jesus, there is a forgiveness that you've received that no one can take away. By saying, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. We are given this inheritance of what it, the world could be like when God is king. Of how much better it could be. When we choose to embrace the flesh and we choose to do things that satisfy me first of all, we are not going to see what God is doing. We're not going to get the reward that God really offers us. We're just going to get these temporary satisfactions that we're always going to be chasing the next high because it's really not that satisfying when we get down to it. We will not experience the fullness of the life that God offers us if we choose to just embrace the way of the flesh. There is a better way. And this is the most important thing. That the way of the Spirit is so much better than the way of the flesh. Because the way of the Spirit isn't going to be about something you do, but something, someone you become. Because the Spirit is doing something in you. It's not your doing to achieve it. Not you trying to be more and more what you're supposed to be. Or you get that satisfaction you want, the momentary satisfaction of the flesh. But the work of the Spirit is doing something so much better. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit. That's that thing that's, that's going to grow out of us because the Spirit is at work. Just like a tree cannot will itself to grow a fruit, it just naturally happens when all of the right elements are there. When the right soil is there, when the sunlight is there, when you know 
the bees have pollinated the flowers. When the rain has fallen, a tree will bear its fruit. When all the right things come together, it's not something it wills on its own. It's not something it can do on its own. It is just what it is made for. And when all those things come together, there is fruit that comes. In the same way for you, for me, the work of the Holy Spirit will bear fruit. When we choose not to walk in the way of the flesh, the Spirit is doing something in us. When we don't just make it about ourselves and self-gratification, when we don't just try to get that next high, that next endorphin rush, that next like on Instagram or that new TikTok follower, when it's not just about our own gain, God is doing something in us in the presence of the Holy Spirit that will come out. And he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. There are no rules that will make these things happen. You trying to do all the right things will not cause this to happen. It is only through intimacy with God. You saying, I will be more joyful today, might cause you to smile a bit more, but it won't last. It is only the work of the Spirit that causes this to grow out of us. You cannot earn this. This is God's work in you. You need to be in step with the Spirit, and this will come out. Some of you know this yourselves. Some of you, you've experienced it lately. You've talked to me about how you have this peace that you don't understand. As we've talked on the phone or in small groups, you said, you know, in the midst of everything being a struggle, you're still somehow finding peace. That is the work of the Spirit in your life. That is the fruit of the Spirit. That is from a lifetime of going, I love God, I love neighbor. It's not about my selfish desire. This is what comes out. You know people like this. You know people who are so loving and you go, how can you be loving like that? Why aren't you angry? Why do you love them? Well, this is the work of loving God, loving neighbor, and not making it about yourself. And people who have this incredible patience with other people, people who just have this self-control, this gentleness, this faith, like this goodness about them. And you wonder, how can this be? This is what the Spirit does in us, friends. This isn't something that you earn. This isn't something that you strive for in your personal striving. Like, I've just got to get more joyful. I've just got to get more patience. I've just got to get more peace. That's not going to work. This comes from intimacy. This comes from presence with God. This comes from you, from me, making a time to know who this God is that I worship and saying, well, I love you, God, with all that I am. So I will love my neighbors as I love myself. And I won't make it about my own desires of trying to get that good feeling, that rush I want. But I will be faithful to you. This is not easily achieved because so many of us want to quickly just jump into what makes me feel good right now. But Paul is saying, and I believe this to be true, that's not the way of God. That's the flesh. And guess what? That won't satisfy you. The most important thing the Holy Spirit is doing is turning you into the person you've always been meant to be. To embrace that freedom, to when we step in step with Him, when you walk with the Holy Spirit in your daily life, when you make that a priority, you are becoming who you've always been meant to be, that free person who can experience life in all of its fullness, that isn't just chasing that next high, that next like, that next good feeling, but is finding the goodness of God and the fruit grows out of it. He says, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. We who choose to embrace Jesus as Lord, we who choose to follow Jesus, who by the Spirit have been guided to this point, 
We say, it's not about my flesh. It's not about that next high, that next thing that's going to make me feel good for a moment. It's about the way of God, the way of the Spirit, the way of Jesus. And when we choose to walk in step, grow in our intimacy with God through the power of the Holy Spirit, God is going to grow in us through the Spirit this fruit, this love, this joy, this peace, this goodness, this this kindness, this self-control, this patience. These are the things that we desire. How many do you, people do you know who deeply desire peace? And so they chase it. They chase peace. It goes, comes in the form of vacations. Or it comes in the form of a new car. Or it comes in the form of a relationship. And that will not last. Only by staying in step with the Spirit will we find peace. How many people want to be joyful? But all they chase is happiness through sex, through money, through self-actualizations. And really, they're still hollow, and they just chase the next thing that will last a little while. But it does not last. There is no law against the fruit of the Spirit. There's no timetable to say this is going to end anytime soon. This is the work of God in us. When we stay intimate with the Spirit, this is the most important thing, friends. Because I know it's what you desire. That deep down you have this desire to be more loving, to be kind, to have self-control. And so you try and do what you can to achieve it. But it's not going to work, friends. It's only by crucifying the flesh, saying... You know what, Jesus, you went to the cross for me. So I'm not going to make it about me. Because you've already done that. You freed me. So I'm going to make it about you. And I'm going to love my neighbor like I love myself. Because you, Jesus, love me so much that you went to the cross for me. And when we can embrace that and we can stay in step with the Spirit, we can experience the freedom God offers. And in that freedom, we don't indulge things for ourselves to try and chase it, but we embrace the opportunity to love others, to live like Jesus. And when we walk in step with the Spirit, the Spirit grows in us an abundance of that ability to love, to have joy, to have peace. He gives us all those things we chase after, friends. We chase after it so much. Sometimes we chase after it saying, well, if I just looked like this, or if I just acted like this, or if I just had this, or if I just was with this person, but that won't last. It is only when we stay in step with the Spirit, when we grow in intimacy with God, that God does that in us. We can't chase it. We can't earn it. It is the real gift of the Spirit. A sense of peace, a sense of love, the ability to be patient, kind, beyond our understanding. We know people who have this experience, and we love it when we see it in them, and we desire it for ourselves. And they have only grown that by a long obedience, faithfulness, to stay in step with the Spirit. So what are you doing to stay in step with the Spirit? My friends, this is my desire for you. I want you to know that peace that the Spirit offers. I want you to experience and express that joy, that kindness, that goodness, that is only through the work of the Spirit in your life. And I know for myself, I'm not perfect. I'm very far from it. But when I stay intimate with God, when I stay and choose to walk in step with the Spirit and not indulge my own desires for whatever kind of release or high or freedom in a moment that we, I think I deserve, but I embrace the true freedom that Jesus offers to love others, to love God. When I walk in step with that, do I, ex I experience love, 
joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, self-control, all those things that the Spirit does in us. It is only when I'm in step with the Spirit. Friends, how will you stay intimate with the Spirit? Will you spend more time praying? That could work. I don't know. But again, I don't think it's about doing more. It's actually about doing less. Doing less of the things that are self-indulgent, that are about the flesh, and being open to what the Spirit is inviting us to do on a daily basis. To live a life that loves God and loves our neighbor as ourselves. My friends, I desire this for you so much because I know the freedom I have found in that. And again, I'm not perfect. I've got so much growing to do. But that freedom that the Spirit offers is so worth it. And I pray you embrace it. I pray you embrace it today by choosing not to do the things that will just give you that temporary high, that feeling of happiness in a moment. But you embrace the Spirit who gives you a joy everlasting, a peace eternal, and a hope that will last you forever. Friends, I love you. And because I love you, I want you to know this. Jesus died and rose again for you. You may have heard it before. You may have embraced it. He died for your forgiveness of sins. For the freedom of life he invites us into. The life in all of its fullness. But it is up to us to embrace that, to accept that, and to walk daily in step with the Spirit and embrace what he offers us. To choose to love God, to love our neighbors ourselves. And only then will we see the fruit of that freedom he offers us. I pray you see that fruit. I pray you stop chasing those things that offer you temporary happiness or relief or momentary fixes. And you chase that spirit and walk in step with him. Because he is waiting for you to do just that.